intensifying close call here in New York. Authorities say a man pushed this woman off the platform just as a train was approaching. Thankfully, she was able to roll out of the way just in time. The train barely grazing her. The suspect was arrested. She suffered minor. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. February 29th, that was the day of the first known death in the U.S. from coronavirus. Within weeks, America's financial capital came under assault with COVID killing thousands before making its deadly spread to other cities and counties and is now ravaging America's heartland. As of this moment, 251,970 Americans have died from COVID-19. Every 15 minutes, 10 Americans die. Yet unlike so many American tragedies, this one hasn't brought us together. Some Americans still believe the pandemic is fake. But Steve Osinsami leads us off tonight with the impact of the lives lost in the communities that have shouldered the biggest burdens. trying to find their way back. They're trying to get a, a proper understanding of what direction. Have, have mercy right now in the name of Jesus. Let them know that all they got to do is call in the name of Jesus. Here in the heart of rural Georgia, Reverend Willard Weston is praying for mercy from the coronavirus, begging the Lord to keep it from stealing more lives. Let us understand, Lord, it can't be our way, it can't be my way, but it has to be your way. And when you have spoken, Lord, we must submit ourselves unto you. At Sardis Baptist Church in Dawson, this is what services look like before the pandemic. <laughs> Our services here today streamed online with only a few people willing to sit in the pews. Families are still worried that if they come to church, they could get sick and die. Even the Wednesday night Bible study is now broadcast from the pastor's home. God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to do well abundantly. We wouldn't be visiting this place if it weren't for these next unfortunate facts. There were 32 people here who died of COVID-19 during the height of the pandemic, making the death rate here the 12th deadliest of any county in the country. This is Terrell County, Georgia, the birthplace of Otis Redding, whose blue songs are the pride of the people. I left my home in Georgia, headed for the Frisco Bay. It is far away from the slick streets and fancy restaurants of any big city, home to about 9,000 people, most of them black and most of them poor. Across America, there is a new signpost on a very tragic road. More than a quarter million people in this country have now died from COVID-19. ABC News has joined our ABC-owned stations in cities across the country, taking a closer look at the data, and it underlines the 100 counties in the country with the highest rate of death, many of them rural and poor. We know in rural America already has a capacity problem when it comes to health care. There is just not the same level of access as there is in urban hubs. What we're actually seeing, and when we look at our data, rural communities actually experience a much more severe spike in cases and deaths than what we see in urban areas, which shows that these epidemics are much more drawn out. So if you have a massive spike in cases and deaths, the health systems there that are still even open just can't withstand the weight of the volume of patients and thereby from that, many people end up dying just because of lack of access to quality care. Both Randolph and Terrell counties in rural Georgia are so terribly high on the list that the ministers here had trouble clearing the red clay from their shoes. They often had to lead more than one funeral a day. This town was shattered with, with I mean, it, it was shattered. One of Reverend Weston's ministers, Polly Ann Tolbert, got sick in March and died a few weeks later. It was a double funeral. The coronavirus killed her husband, Mr. Benjamin Tolbert, too. The reverend was set to deliver the eulogy about an hour before the graveside service when the phone rang in his pocket. I got this call that my first cousin had passed, COVID-19. He, he was like my big brother. 
we were raised up in the house together and, and so forth. So he was that guy that I always looked to for strength when mom died, when, when our parents died, well, when my, my mom died and our grandparents died. He was that person that gave me strength. And I get a call and we didn't know he was ill. He, he became ill quite quickly. He says this is how it was for months, people managing their own grief as they were helping neighbors get through theirs. And giving a hug or a shoulder to cry on felt deadly. That has to be hard because I'm assuming that every time someone went to a hospital, you worried they weren't coming back. Exactly. And he died alone. They died alone. They couldn't be comforted by a loved one. I mean, sometimes you see a loved one, it, you lift it. Your spirit is lifted, and, and they, they didn't have that. And I think that's the saddest part about it. Your faith was tested. It was, it was definitely my faith that Your was faith in God. Exactly. Latasha Taylor says she's being tested too. Her aunt is Miss Polly Ann. And after burying the Tolberts, she had to bury her own mother just two months later. There's a lot of memories that I have of my mom now. Is this from the funeral? Yes. This was her, is her obituary. A lot of memories. I probably haven't opened this since yeah. the day after her funeral. Being an only child, you know, how do you cope? How do you deal with that? My mom has been all I've ever known. And then for her to just suddenly go away. I feel like my family was ripped away from me by something that we could not see or touch. Or maybe we could touch it, we just didn't know that we were touching it. Um, but they were ripped away in an instant, so quickly. And you just don't know how to come to grips with it. What do you say to all of those people who want to say that these deaths are made up? Well, I can absolutely tell you that when I looked at three death certificates, they all had some relation to COVID-19. So whatever this virus is, people that were elderly, or had pre-existing conditions, it was really affecting them. And people died. Now, I've never seen anything else in my 41 years of being alive that has taken people out like that. So there has to be some truth to it. She says the coronavirus has broken her heart into pieces and believes that if her mother lived in a big city with access to better health care, she might still be alive today. Does it feel like the rest of the country forgets about rural areas? Absolutely. Since we're in such small cities or small towns, you know, it's kind of like we don't exist. We're off the map. Um, we're not talked about a lot. The pastor said something that caught our attention, that in his town, there's no hospital, but plenty of funeral homes. I have an urgent care, but not a hospital. But you have four funeral homes. have four funeral homes. Exactly. What sense? I mean, I'm sure that's not by design, but it just is crazy that you have four funeral homes and no hospital. That's true. That's true. It's just, it's like, it, it's almost, it's sort of, sort of like, yeah, we're ready for the dead, yeah. but we're not taking care of the living. Yeah, yeah. But when you look at the number of deaths and take a step back and think about what 250,000 lives really look like, it's a bit overwhelming. Imagine turning on the news and learning that the entire city of Birmingham, Alabama is gone. Or what about Salt Lake City? Or roughly the population of Reno, Nevada? or Buffalo, New York, and my hometown of Peoria, Illinois, with a population of about 110,000, everyone gone more than two times over. And when you look at the number who've been infected in this country at more than 11 million Americans, that's more people than who live in all but 10 states, more people than in North Carolina and Georgia. Latasha Taylor says like many people here, she's tired of being sad. 
My mom would have been celebrating her 63rd birthday on Monday. Um, this is where I'm now happy to come and celebrate her birthday with her. This is the one place in the world where her heart aches the hardest. She told us to share that she's in counseling and that everyone needs to take the coronavirus seriously. Do whatever you have to do to protect yourself and your family. Um, don't just brush it off to think that, you know, it's made up. Um, because a lot of people are dying. Um, that's the lesson that I've learned. People are not here to stay forever. I've learned that. Um, you know, and deal with your grief however you must. For ABC News Live, I'm Steve Osinsami in South Georgia. Four funeral homes, but no hospital. That says it all. Our thanks to Steve for bringing us that. And with the virus surging across the country, President-elect Joe Biden is once again warning that American lives are at stake if the president refuses to work with him and coordinate. Mary Bruce reports in tonight from Wilmington. Tonight, President Trump is nowhere to be seen as the country is reeling from a resurgent pandemic. He hasn't held a public event in nearly a week. Instead of focusing on the virus, the president is singularly focused on the election, refusing to recognize he's lost or coordinate with Joe Biden's team on the transition. And local health officials. In the briefing room today, the vice president not taking any questions. We'll Reporters asking, where is the president? The president-elect growing increasingly concerned for the welfare of the American people. Biden today meeting virtually with a group of bipartisan governors. My transition team hasn't been able to get access to information we need to be able to deal with everything from testing and guidance to the all-important issue of vaccines, distributions, and vaccinations. We asked him about the consequences. How many lives do you think are at risk here if this transition remains stalled? There's no excuse not to share the data and let us begin to plan. Because on day one, it's going to take us time if we don't have access to all this data. It's going to put us behind the eight ball by a matter of a month or more. And that's lives. How many would be lost as a consequence of that? I can't tell you. Almost all of the president's legal challenges have been dismissed. Hitting dead ends, Trump and his campaign are now looking to friendly state lawmakers and election officials to try to overturn the results in key states. States Biden won by tens of thousands of votes. What do you think the president is doing? What are Americans witnessing here? Let me choose my words oh, here. Uh, I think they're witnessing incredible irresponsibility incredibly damaging messages being sent to the rest of the world about how democracy functions. And I think it is, uh, um, well, I don't know his motive, but I, I just think it's totally irresponsible. And he had strong words for the president's actions, questioning if they're even legal. He will go down in history as being one of the most irresponsible presidents in American history. It's. It's just out of the, not even within the norm at all. There's questions whether it's even legal. Some scathing words there from the president-elect. Mary Bruce joins us now from Wilmington, Delaware. And Mary, there was news today from Michigan where the president lost by nearly 150,000 votes. First, we learned that the president called the two Republican officials who had first said they would not certify the votes of majority black Detroit. They then changed their minds and then later tried to rescind their votes. But now the president is inviting Republican state lawmakers to the White House? Yes, Lindsay, he is. And this is all part of a really shockingly bold last-ditch attempt by the president to somehow try and change the election results in this state. You know, today we saw the president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, holding this lengthy press conference. It was laden with false statements and, again, no evidence of any voter fraud. And, in fact, tonight the government official tasked with ensuring election security, Chris Krebs, you'll recall that he's the one that the president fired earlier this week for simply stating that there was no voter fraud 
He's calling that Giuliani press conference the most dangerous hour and 45 minutes of television in American history, Lindsay. Wow. And Mary, just moments after the president-elect's briefing finished, the White House Coronavirus Task Force briefed the public from the White House for the first time in months. We know the Democrats have called for collaboration, but what are Republicans saying tonight about the calls for the administration to work with Biden's team? Well, we have seen some growing calls from Republicans on the Hill urging the White House and the Trump team to go ahead and cooperate with the Biden administration. But of course, they, these are coming from many Republicans who still refuse publicly to even admit that Joe Biden will, in fact, be the next president. And, and they have very little power here. You know, they can try to persuade publicly, try to ramp up some pressure. But of course, they've already adjourned for the Thanksgiving holiday. And all of this really comes down to President Trump, his team, and the official at the GSA who is in charge of ensuring that the transfer and the transition actually begins. Mary Bruce from Wilmington, Delaware, thanks so much. And for more on the presidential transition, we now bring in Dr. Celine Gounder, a member of President-elect Biden's COVID-19 task force and an infectious disease specialist at Bellevue Hospital Center. Dr. Gounder, thank you for joining us, especially during this extremely busy time. Of course, President Trump has not conceded defeat and the GSA has not officially started the transition process. What contact have you had with the current administration's COVID task force and how much has the lack of coordination set back your team? Well, unfortunately, we simply cannot have formal contact with the current administration, with our counterparts on the White House Coronavirus Task Force until the GSA moves forward with ascertainment. Every day that goes by without ascertainment, every day that goes by where we're not having those conversations is a day lost in terms of moving forward on plans for testing, for vaccinations, and, and so on. And, and all of that will translate into lives lost. Now, if you could be talking with the White House Coronavirus Task Force, what types of conversations would be happening right now? Well, we'd really like to know a few things. One is, in terms of the supply chain, where are we at in terms of personal protective equipment, ventilators? You might remember earlier this year, we discovered that many of the ventilators in the stockpile didn't work. So we really need to know what supplies we have at our disposal, where and how easily they could be redeployed based on where they're needed. We also would really like to know where things are at in terms of negotiating with pharmaceutical companies for vaccines, for the monoclonal antibody treatments, uh, so that we can figure out, we can start to strategize about distribution. Um, and some of that's also including conversations with other um, uh, members of the private sector. So for example, retail pharmacy chains or state and local officials. Again, this kind of distribution is a massive logistical challenge. And Americans probably don't remember the polio days, but that's the last time we've really had to do that scale of mass vaccination. And Joe Biden will, of course, take office on January 20th. At the same time, it's believed that a vaccine may already be authorized. How will your task force handle that? Well, in terms of how to how to scale up the vaccine, um, you know, we're really going to be emphasizing distribution to uh, frontline healthcare workers, essential workers, uh, people who are at highest risk. So that will include people, for example, living in uh, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, uh, and then we also realize that communities of color have faced a disproportionate burden of the coronavirus pandemic. They will be among those targeted. But you know, part of Part of the logistics here is also figuring out which of these vaccines will work for which of these populations best uh, because of the characteristics of the patients, the vaccine, and, and the distribution characteristics. NIH Director Francis Collins said that 90% of Americans need to take the vaccine for this pandemic to end quickly. Realistically, how many Americans do you think will actually take it, and how can you change hearts and minds on this? Well, unfortunately, there are a lot of vaccine skeptics. There were a lot of people who were hesitant to get vaccinated even before coronavirus for any number of reasons. Some of them don't want to be told by the government what to do. Some of them are suspicious of the pharmaceutical industry. Some people think, well, natural infection is better, which it is not. Um, and then now you have all of this politicization injected into the approval of this current vaccine or the current vaccines for coronavirus. Uh, and so I can understand why people are skeptical. I would say 
that we are not putting pressure on the FDA, the Biden-Harris team, we are not putting pressure on the FDA to expedite the approval of uh, the coronavirus vaccines. We really want them to conduct their normal scientific vetting uh, to provide the emergency use authorization so that people can really have confidence in this vaccine. But we're also going to have to do a lot of work around messaging about reaching out to all of those different communities who do feel skeptical and are hesitant and understand where they're coming from and address their particular concerns. The president-elect said today he would not lock down this country, but if the worst fears about holiday travel prove true, would you recommend a national lockdown? Well, we've learned a lot since the spring. Uh, I think of the spring as the on and off light switch, and now we have a dimmer switch. We can be a lot more targeted in our restrictions. We don't have to lock everything down. Uh, we know that certain uh, types of settings, for example, indoor dining, uh, private parties are far higher risk for transmission than are, say, schools. So we can be targeted geographically by zip code based on community transmission, and we can be targeted by the type type of setting that's most likely to transmit. Now, President-elect Biden stressed the need for a national coordinated plan to combat this disease. How difficult will a national plan be after the Trump administration gave power to the states to craft their own strategies? And do you expect governors like Governor Kristi Noem of South Dakota to get on board? Well, it's important to remember that we are a federalist society, a federalist government. And so you're always going to have differences among the different states in terms of what they're doing. Some of that's frankly appropriate because they do have different uh, demographics, different settings, you know, urban versus rural. It's not going to be necessarily the same strategy that makes sense. But you do need a nationally coordinated plan. Uh, and I think you're going to see an empowerment of the CDC in terms of being able to truly disseminate guidelines, recommendations and importantly, technical assistance to the states and local health departments to really help them in, in partnership. Dr. Gounder, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Now to the late warning from the CDC urging Americans not to travel this Thanksgiving and to consider the risks of having a Thanksgiving dinner with people from outside of your own household. And more officials also sounding the alarm today, especially about college students. The mayor of Boston telling them, if you go home, stay there. Our Tom Yamas is in Boston. Tonight, as families debate how to spend Thanksgiving, millions are rushing to get tested. And now the CDC, with that warning, strongly urging Americans not to travel for the holiday and only celebrate with people in their own households. The guidance creating a particular challenge for families who want to see their kids away at college. I think I'll get a test before I leave just so I don't put my family in danger. But experts caution testing could provide a false sense of security. A single negative test is not a pass to say, I am fine, I can now go do whatever I want, because you may well still be infected and incubating. You, you can't test anything. your way into Thanksgiving dinner. Boston's mayor telling students if they go home, stay there. If they do go home for, for the holidays, we're asking them not to come back if they could, if they could just do the rest of the semester online. And at Boston University, they're recommending students not go home at all. In a perfect world, you'd want students to celebrate Thanksgiving right here on campus. Absolutely. We're encouraging all of our students to stay here on campus. We know that travel increases risk of viral transmission. Sophomore Amanda Bittner is one of those students staying on campus. So I didn't want to go back then and bring it back to Boston. One doctor in Utah saying think about the most vulnerable people in your family. Some people have said, you know, Gather at Thanksgiving and regather for your funeral on New Year's Day. And that's a bleak way to put it, but at this point, we really have to be honest. Governors from multiple states with the new PSA. Mask up, Illinois. Mask up, Ohio. Mask up, Indiana. Those same governors now pleading with Americans to avoid big family gatherings, writing in a new op-ed, quote, as hard as it will be not to see them this Thanksgiving, imagine how much harder it would be if their chairs are empty next year. And many are saying that if you can hold off this holiday, you'll be able to be with your family or friends the holiday in 2021. Tom Yamas joins us now from a testing site at Boston's Logan International Airport. And Tom, officials have warned for weeks now to avoid traveling for the upcoming holidays. And tonight you're learning that some people may actually be heeding that advice. 
That's right, Lindsay. American Southwest and United all reporting a spike in cancellations. The TSA saying they're expecting travel to be significantly lower this year than last Thanksgiving. But as you mentioned, we are seeing a new trend at the airports because some people still have to travel. Pilots still have to work and people have to work at the airport. There are now testing sites right here at the airport. They do rapid testing. You can make a reservation, an appointment, just like other testing sites. But they also tend to run out of tests, just like we're seeing across the country. Lindsay. Tom Yamas. Thank you. And when we come back, Prince William's response to the investigation into an infamous interview with his mother were forged documents used to dupe Diana. Lori Loughlin's husband is reporting to prison. She's still behind bars. The latest on the college admissions cheating scandal. But up next, suffering in silence. So many families struggling this holiday season. Mothers going without food so their children won't starve. Stay with us. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The coronavirus, everyone has concerns. And tomorrow, Dr. Jennifer Ashton is here, helping you better understand it all, helping you protect yourself and your family. Your questions answered tomorrow. On Good Morning America. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraq. 18,000 tons. Ismael? David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank, Thank you for Thank you. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Welcome back. We've talked already a lot about Thanksgiving and travel, but there are many families who won't be able to put food on the table without help. The historic number of jobs lost another 742,000 filing for unemployment claims this week, and unexpected medical bills have created a surge of families desperate for food. And while a number of charities, agencies, and schools are stepping up, Congress is still at a standstill not making any headway to pass another bipartisan coronavirus relief package. Kira Phillips has the heartbreaking toll this waiting game is having on our fellow citizens who are in desperate need of help. This is no ordinary walk to school because you won't see Shauna Gray's three children or how she usually gets them dressed, packs their backpacks and packs their lunch. Because in this pandemic, there is no school. And there is no lunch, unless she makes this walk. A 90-minute journey one way. For my children, it's all worth it, and I wouldn't change a thing. For free lunch, which means dinner, too. You are a blessing to, to me and to my, my family. It's a time Shauna never imagined would get this bad. Sometimes embarrassing, but it's what you have to go through. Is there a night that you and your husband go without food just to make sure the kids have food? Most of the time. Um, we will make sure that they have had their portion and maybe another portion before we would eat. And me and Dad have kind of gotten to the point of now that we only eat maybe once a day. All right, y'all. Let's set us set us down. Meet the Gray family. Three kids with special needs. Dad, a dishwasher. 
and Shauna, a server. So just to get a little bit of food is a hard deal nowadays. Both of them lost their jobs when restaurants were forced to close. Some milk this morning. Entering their apartment is humbling. Shauna, what is the hardest part of your day at this point? When you hear your daughter say to you, Mommy, can we move? Because this place just got too many bugs. Oh, Mommy, I'm tired of the, of the mice running across my feet when I go to the bathroom. I don't want to get up and go to the bathroom. Um, my son started peeing on himself. We had got worked so hard to get him to go to the bathroom, which is a task when you have a child that's nonverbal. He goes to the bathroom, but at night he will pee his bed because he's scared that something's going to run across his feet. Worried, anxious, but thankful because they are one of one in every six families getting food from a food bank. Hispanic and black families hit the hardest. Let me ask you guys this. What are your favorite foods that you get from school? Apples. Apples. We got, we, we got cheese sticks and, and, and some bologna, hot dogs, and some, hmm, that's it. That sounds delicious. Are you grateful for the food? Mm-hmm. I like it. Grateful hearts. Fueled by an unprecedented pandemic pace of pantry production. This is the Capital Area Food Bank. And this is what's happening seven days a week, 18 hours a day. Rada, here we are in our nation's capital. Give it to me straight. Every day, how many kids are going hungry? We have over 200,000 kids who are going hungry every day. And that's a 60% increase just in these last few months of the pandemic. So you're getting families calling in that never expected to ever be in this position. Never, ever, because they had paychecks, they had jobs. Many may have been living paycheck to paycheck, but they were making things, you know, they were making things meet. Rada says this pandemic is pushing child hunger to the brink. The Capital Area Food Bank has gone from serving 30 million meals to 50 million. So you've purchased five to seven times more food in this time. That's right. From canned tuna to peanut butter to rice to cereal in the dry area and produce. 40% of everything that we provide to our neighbors in need is produce. Onions, cabbages, potatoes, turnips, carrots, fresh, healthy, nutritious food. Food that right now is an eternal blessing. We thank you for this day, Lord God, that you have made. Every day, lines around the corner at every local food bank in the nation's capital. In Jesus' name, amen. Rain or shine. I'm a single parent. Just trying to provide for my family right now. I'm not working, you know, due to the pandemic. But yes. it's just a blessing to be here. The number of hungry Americans tripling in just one year. Did you ever think it would get to this point where you had to go to a food bank? No, I never did think that would ever happen, and I never think it would be this hard. Amanda Scott didn't see this coming either. A grilled cheese dinner is a gift. Has there ever been a night where you're lying in bed worried about where the next meal is going to come from? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I do worry about that, and I pray about it, you know, not go and I try to figure out what my next step I will have to do to make sure he's okay. He is her grandson, Kamari. He has asthma and POTS. Amanda has a lung condition. Making masks for extra money and depending on the food bank is their survival right now. What do you want other kids to know about this pandemic, Kamari? That this pandemic is not a joke. This pandemic has taken away so many of my grandmothers, family members, and some of mine. Who keeps you strong? Mostly her. <laughs> As is the theme throughout this story, <laughs> that no matter how hard this time is. You know what I notice about you guys? There's a lot of love in your family. Yeah. Where does that come from? Uh, from my mom. There is also a lot of love feeding souls too. What keeps you going, Shauna? My faith, my optimism. Um, Cause I know I've had a lot of bad things come, but I've had a lot of good. You know, those three little children out there are my good. And just to see a smile on their face, no matter what I go through, that's bad. They're worth it. They're worth it. 
still smiling and counting those blessings. Our thanks so much for Kira for that. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime. So many questions tonight surrounding the latest tragedy to impact singer Bobby Brown, who has lost another child. And now imagine the best day of your life being called a super spreader event. We'll speak to the couple whose wedding is being called just that. And so many lawsuits from the president targeting the election results. We have an update on if any of them have been successful. But first, our tweet of the day. Mary Bruce mentioned it earlier in the show. It's from the former official who oversaw election cybersecurity and lost his job after he said 2020 was the most secure election ever. Just read his reaction to the press conference from the president's attorney. Just read his reaction uh, from attorney Rudy Giuliani. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people were just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. This is the first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night. 24-7. ABC News. There for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. We turn now to the Trump campaign's crumbling legal strategy as the president and his allies continue to make baseless claims about voter fraud and a stolen election. We take a look now by the numbers, how they're losing this battle in courts across the country. 19, that's how many election-related lawsuits the Trump campaign has filed to date in five different battleground states since Election Day. 16 of them have had unfavorable outcomes so far. They've been denied, dismissed, or withdrawn. And at least six of those rulings are now on appeal. The Trump campaign has had just one win, a Pennsylvania case to toss out a small number of mailed ballots that arrived after Election Day but were postmarked on time where the voter identification was incomplete. In two cases, there have been no rulings yet, but none of these cases can realistically change the outcome of the election. Biden is projected to beat Trump by 306 electoral votes to Trump's 232 votes, and Biden is ahead by almost 6 million in the popular vote so far. Despite the Trump team's conspiracy theories and patently false claims that Trump won, Joe Biden will become the 46th president on January 20th. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime. President Trump has invited leaders of Michigan's Republican-controlled state legislature to Washington as he continues his historically unprecedented campaign to change an election that he lost. We'll speak to the Michigan Secretary of State next. And the surprise found in one famous Christmas tree. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest.
Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This place is all about magic and wonder. That's what it's all about. Magic. Yes. Yes. Christmas in the trenches. Prepare to have your little doggy mind blown. This is what being live is all about. This is like ABC see. News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank, Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. a week from Thanksgiving, the CDC out with a new advisory, urging people to avoid traveling for the holidays as all 50 states see an increase in COVID-19 cases. Airlines say they are seeing a significant increase in cancellations for the Thanksgiving holiday. United, American, and Southwest Airlines are all experiencing a drop in bookings. They say the uptick in cancellations is a result of the recent spike in COVID-19 cases. The number of travelers flying in the U.S. is down more than 60% from just a year ago. Lori Lachlan's husband, Massimo Giannulli, has reported to prison for his role in the Varsity Blues college admission scandal. Are you going to fight these charges? The 57-year-old is the fashion designer behind the popular Massimo clothing brand. He was sentenced to five months behind bars and ordered to pay a quarter million dollar fine after pleading guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit fraud. The couple accused of paying half a million dollars to Varsity Blues alleged mastermind Rick Singer to get their two daughters, Olivia Jade and Isabella, into USC. Stay them both as rowers to recruit them for the team, though neither ever participated in the sport. Lachlan, best known for playing the wholesome Aunt Becky on Full House. So, you must be uh, Rebecca. No, please, please call me Becky. Has been behind bars since October 30th. On Tuesday, two days before reporting to jail, Giannulli was spotted in Beverly Hills, sporting a new look, the shaved head and growing beard, a far cry from his previously clean-cut image. As the investigation begins into whether Princess Diana was conned into sitting down for her infamous 1995 interview with the BBC, Prince William is now weighing in, saying he tentatively welcomes the television network's decision to launch an official probe, calling it a step in the right direction and saying it should help establish the truth behind the actions that led to the Panorama interview. Over 23 million people watched as Princess Diana sat down with Martin Bashir for the interview that should the world and the royal family over two decades ago. Do you think Mrs. Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us. 
in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. <laughs> but how Bashir got the princess to talk to him is now under investigation. Her brother, Earl Spencer, alleges Bashir peddled lies and smears in order to convince Diana to speak exclusively with him. Bashir has yet to respond to the claims, the BBC saying he's too ill to comment. Tragedy continuing for singer Bobby Brown. His son, Bobby Brown Jr., was found dead at an Encino, California condo Wednesday afternoon. No foul play is suspected in the death of the 28-year-old. Five years earlier, Bobby Jr.'s half-sister Bobby Christina died when she was just 22. Her discovery in a bathtub eerily similar to that of her mother, Whitney Houston, when she was found dead in 2012. We are still in the month of November, but talk of a Christmas miracle is already blowing up on social media. The buzz surrounds a 75-foot-tall Norway spruce mm -hmm. that made a two-day, 170-mile trek from upstate New York. It arrived this past Saturday at Rockefeller Center, where crews are decorating it for the annual tree lighting ceremony. It turns out a tiny owl also made that trip, hiding on a branch deep inside that tree. The bird went three days without food or water, but now it's recovering at a wildlife center where staffers say it's on a steady diet of fluids and mice. Not surprisingly, they've named it Rockefeller. Welcome back. Our democratic systems are currently facing a stress test with the Trump campaign baselessly claiming there is widespread voter fraud without any evidence and losing lawsuit after lawsuit in court. Now, one state the Trump campaign has tried to focus on is Michigan. And we should be very clear here, President-elect Joe Biden has won the state and by roughly 150,000 votes far past the margin. Donald Trump won that state by four years ago. Joining us now is the Michigan Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benton. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Let's dive right into this. Two nights ago, two Republicans declined to certify the results in heavily Democratic and heavily black Wayne County. That spurred this angry public outcry. Take a listen. You talked about not certifying Detroit, even though you acknowledged that Livonia, a city, by the way, I know you know is 95 percent white, had bigger variances than Detroit, which is 80 percent black. We understand. Just know when you try to sleep tonight, the law isn't on your side. History won't be on your side. Your conscience will not be on your side. And Lord knows when you go to meet your maker, your soul is going to be very, very warm. Some damning words there. Later that night, the two Republicans reverse course and certify the results. Now, a day later, they want to change their mind. Now, can you bring us up to speed about that situation? And what can we now expect when the whole state votes to certify its results on Monday? Well, I think, you know, first, it's clear that the voters of Wayne County and Michigan have spoken and they've made a choice. And there's no legal or factual basis for anyone to question that choice or challenge it. And so we accept the Wayne County certification, just as we accepted every one of our 83 counties certification, uh, as it was properly made in a public vote in a public meeting. Uh, and now we're moving forward and calling on the Board of State canvassers to do the same. Now, how concerning is it that the President of the United States actually called those two Republicans? It's certainly improper for any candidate on either side of the aisle to attempt to interfere with or obstruct a process that is very well ingrained in the law uh, with an eye towards the processes, protecting the will of the voters. Uh, so, you know, that is what it is. But as I've said, you know, repeatedly throughout this entire election cycle, and certainly since the polls closed November 3rd, candidates don't choose the, who wins an election, the voters do. Uh, and the voters indeed do have spoken in Michigan and, and their will will carry the day. And again, let's be very clear here. You've said publicly where evidence exists of actual fraud or wrongdoing, it should be submitted in writing to the Bureau of Elections. Has any evidence been submitted? No, but if it is, and if there's, you know, certainly there has been no evidence of widespread fraud. Uh, there's been no evidence of any irregularities of any kind. The only, the only issues that emerged during the very contentious open meeting at the Wayne County Board of Canvassers were those with regards to clerical errors, which there are actually less of. Uh, this time around than there were in 2016 when the board did certify then uh, the results. And so our office will be after the certification is done, as we always do, conducting performance-based audits to look into any clerical errors, as well as the state's first statewide risk limiting audit. Uh, and again, under law, we have to wait until the certification occurs to do that. Uh, so we've got protocols in place to assure voters of the accuracy and the integrity of the process. And we're going to continue to follow those protocols. And we expect everyone else to do their jobs and do the same. And you're already talking about after the certification. Are you confident that the State Board of Canvassers will certify on November 23rd? 
but it's certainly what the expectation is. We're calling on them to do what is very clearly laid out in the law. Once each county formally certifies the canvas, it then is cast onto the state board to play the administrative role of formally uh, certifying the statewide election, and then we can move forward from there uh, with the post-election audits. Uh, so we you know, expect everyone to simply do the job that they were that they're required to do under the law. And again, the law is quite clear on the administrative role that the state board plays. Now, if the state board is deadlocked, like the Wayne County Board, will you immediately pursue a remedy? in the courts? Uh, that's really more of a question for the attorney general. We're really focused on just making sure the state board has what it needs to do its job. Uh, and it very clearly does. Uh, and again, this is really should be just a simple protocol, run of the mill administrative process. And uh, it is you know, important for us to focus on that and to affirm and confirm with the state board their intention to do the same. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this appears to, to really be a, a stress test for our democracy. In your mind, is Michigan passing this test? And are there any reforms that you might recommend ahead of the next election? And what happens in the future uh, of future elections if people refuse to certify results, particularly if they're fair? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, I think we have to be very clear what is happening right now is a moment, and it's just a moment, and we will get through this moment, and the will of the people in Michigan and throughout the country will be heard. But once we get through this moment, we do have to examine, both here in Michigan and across the country, how we can come together and assure voters on both sides of the aisle that no matter how you voted or who you voted for, this election was secure, it was a success, and moving forward, we need to work together to continue to reaffirm and even grow voters' confidence in our very well secured uh, and accessible uh, elections process. So that is the work ahead of us, both again in Michigan and nationwide. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm looking towards that because we will have to address the negative implications of this essentially PR and political campaign that's been waged against our democracy in the past few days. Uh, and, uh, but again, I'm confident we will get through this. We will move forward and we will do the important work of healing our democracy moving forward. Jocelyn Benson, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Now to a wedding day turned super spreader event. A young Ohio couple is speaking out after several guests later tested positive for COVID-19, including the newlyweds themselves. Our Will Reeve reports. Newlyweds Anthony and Michaela vowed to support each other in sickness and in health, but they didn't expect that solemn promise to be tested at their own wedding, as they told Cincinnati's WLWT. I mean, I didn't think that almost half of our wedding guests were going to get sick. Now, 32 of the guests at their Halloween ceremony have contracted COVID-19, including the bride, the groom, and three of their grandparents. Even though the couple cut down their list to 83 people, provided masks and hand sanitizer, their wedding is now being called a super spreader event. That's what was like, maybe the super spreader is the dance floor. I mean, everyone's in each other's space and there's no mask. This is just one of multiple weddings linked to COVID outbreaks nationwide. An October wedding in New York with 113 guests led to at least 34 cases, put 159 people in quarantine, and forced the closure of several schools. In Washington state, a 300-person wedding is now linked to more than 40 coronavirus cases. This sort of event um, is, is very frustrating to public health because it, it increases those numbers. It makes our job a lot harder. And in rural Maine, the CDC linking an August wedding of 55 people to 177 confirmed COVID cases and at least seven deaths. Weddings can be a perfect storm where we let down our guard with distancing and many let down their guard with masks, especially when weddings have people traveling in from lots of different cities. It just increases the risk beyond a, an average day that you're going to be exposed to the virus. Our thanks to Will for that. And when we come back, newly released blockbusters from your couch. Is this the future? Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. This place is all about magic and wonder. That's what it's all about. Magic. Yes. Yes. Christmas in the trenches. Prepare to have your little doggy mind blown. Reality 
is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. The coronavirus. Everyone has concerns. And tomorrow, Dr. Jennifer Ashton is here, helping you better understand it all, helping you protect yourself and your family. Your questions answered tomorrow. On Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, and it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are set to drop to the lowest level in three decades. The struggling economy and few Americans traveling by car or plane has resulted in a drop in the burning of fossil fuels that produce greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. The study from the research group Bloomberg NEF found emissions will be down this year to its lowest level since 1983. It's one of the most hotly anticipated movies of the holiday season and plot twist you may not have to go to the theater to watch it. Rebecca Jarvis has more on the decision to stream the sequel to Wonder Woman 2 and what that could mean for the future of movies. Welcome to the future. And it appears to be the future. Warner Brothers announcing its highly anticipated Wonder Woman 1984 will be released on Christmas Day in limited theaters, but primarily streaming on Time Warner's HBO Max. Nothing good is born from lies. In these unprecedented times, Hollywood studios have had to resort to extraordinary measures, trying to lasso in audiences. Box office expectations were massive for this film. In 2017, Wonder Woman bringing in nearly $1 billion. Well, now it's my turn. Get used to it. Studios are trying to come up with some formula that if they go online, it's going to work and it's going to make them some money, at least some of the money back that they invested in these big tentpole movies. Many major film studios have delayed theatrical release dates until 2021 or sent them straight to their streaming services, as our parent company Disney did with Mulan, released to Disney Plus. And Disney Plus now planning their own Christmas Day release of the Pixar film Soul, starring Jamie Foxx, heading to the streaming service the same day as Wonder Woman. Yes! Warner Brothers released Christopher Nolan's Tenet only in theaters, but with audiences reluctant to return, box office numbers were disappointing in the U.S. The film earning just $56 million in the U.S. since its release. This is unprecedented. This is nothing like we've experienced before. And until theaters reopen, we don't know. Our thanks to Rebecca for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. But first, take a listen.
That's Grover Wilhelmsen battling COVID, intubated, unable to speak, but playing his violin nonetheless. He was a retired orchestra teacher, and he wanted to use the power of music to inspire and thank the Nevada hospital staff for everything that they're doing. He wrote a note to his nurse, and she made it happen. He played for hours over two days. After battling COVID for more than a month, he was recently discharged and is now in recovery. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and good night.